Uh, ki ngā iwi o tēnei rohe, ki tā te awa me ngā te tua rangatira me ngā hapu katoa o tēnei rohe, tēnā koutou. Uh, ki a koutou ngā manu kōrero o tēnei hui akoranga, uh, tēnā koutou. Ki a koutou ngā kai whakarongo me ngā kai titiro, uh, ka nui takumihi ki a koutou katoa. He uri tēnei nō te raroa me ngā te pākeha. Ko māmari, tōku ingoa. Kia ora, everybody. Nice to see you. Okay, so, the Legal Māori Resource Hub. It's changed names a couple of times. I have also called it the Māori Legal Resource Hub. And uh, if, every so often I do get confused by my own uh, actions. So what I want to do just briefly is to set out some of the, a little bit of the context in which our new uh, digital resource has now arisen. So this is the latest output of a series of outputs that came out of what was called the Legal Māori Project. Now, this all started in 2000 and, oh, crikey, seven. Uh, two th oh, hang on. No, 2006, actually, was when the idea was born, and this had to do with me being at home on maternity leave, breastfeeding my son and making the mistake of reading emails from my work. Uh, and there was an email conversation going on at the time about whether or not for students at Victoria University and, and the law faculty in particular, we should actually um, provide an exemption or waiver, if you like, to those students who would like to submit their essays in Te Reo Māori. The waiver was not in favour of actually using Te Reo Māori. The waiver was one that said, no, really, English is the core language of law. We really... Let's have a debate about whether or not we really should be having students submitting essays or, sub or sitting their exams in te reo Māori at all, because Māori is not a core language of law in this country. Um, yeah, so when I was reading this email trail, uh, I got a little bit hot under the collar and gripped my son a little bit more tightly than I possibly should have and uh, ended up sending off a few emails and effectively saying to my colleagues and to myself, I know this, that Māori is a language of law. I know it's a language of law. There's been at least 200 years of engagement between Māori and English speakers on matters of Western law. Okay, so I know this is the case, where is the evidence? And so that sent me off on a journey of a couple of years, at least, to find sources. And I know there are a couple of people here today. Um, I saw Max and I saw Michael here, who have been part of this journey as we built towards getting a whole lot of funding from uh, what was then Forced and now IMBI to basically digitise a whole lot of material from the 19th and 20th centuries that showed Māori engaging in law, West, by which I mean Western law, and communicating in Māori about Western legal ideas. It was very much my intention that we would uh, excavate the language, if you like, or our lexicon for words and phrases pertaining in particular to Western law. I already knew that there was a customary law vocabulary, and that's um, a pretty important point, actually, which I'll come to shortly. But that process has led to these uh, outputs. So the first one there, the archive, much of this material was archival. We had uh, speeches in Te Reo Māori um, issued by Māori members of parliament that were then, they might speak in Te Reo Māori in the chamber, have their words translated and then the translation will be back translated and disseminated to Māori communities. Uh, there were um, court hearings that were reported in the Māori newspapers in Te Reo Māori. There was voluminous correspondence between various iwi and the Crown uh, engaging in debate about legal Māori concepts. There were thousands of pages of uh, legislation that was, in the 19th century, prior to 1909 actually, translated into Māori and disseminated among Māori communities. The Gazette, the Kahiti, uh, was translated into Te Reo Māori until 19... Well, it was a Māori, Māori Kahiti that, until 1933. So actually, we had no problem finding the material and the process of digitisation and creating what was to be the legal Māori corpus. 
So the archive, which you can see now, uh, if you go to, if you just Google uh, Legal Māori Archive, you can go and see the archive itself, which g allows you uh, access to some of those scans of those 19th century texts. Uh, the corpus, which was basically a collection of um, eight million word tokens gathered from the digitised texts. texts. And then from that, I had a team of research assistants who trawled the texts looking for vocabulary, because this was what was called a lexicographical project. I didn't know it at the time, but wiser people than me told me that that was what it was. A, a, a project exploring a Māori legal lexicon where we had to find it in the first place. So trawling the texts, looking for Māori words and phrases that imported, communicated, wrestled with ideas of Western law. So the lexicon was about 5,000 words. We came up with that in 2010. But what we needed to do then, that wasn't enough. That's not enough to create a dictionary. That was the end point. Because really, at the end of it all, I thought, I really want those Māori law students, all those Māori speaking law students, be they Māori or not, to have a dictionary that they can use, that they can then, uh, that can then facilitate their ability to submit their assignments in Te Very kind of quotidian, you know, very basic kind of desire that I had at the outset of all this. Uh, but we had this lexicon of 5,000 words. Our job was then to test those words, to test the words and test the phrases, to check that they really stood up to scrutiny within the corpus. So that was a, uh, a particular tool um, that we needed to, to use the corpus to be able to exp explore how words were used in all those texts, and I'll show you what it looks like uh, in a little while. And at the end of all that, we tested all those lexicon terms, and we came up with um, just, uh, just under half of those that were robust and had enough evidence for use over that uh, over the period of 1828, which was our earliest text, to 2009, which was our latest text that we incorporated into the corpus. And then in 2013, we published our dictionary, uh, He Papa Kupu Reo Ture, a dictionary of Māori legal terms, and apparently it's a dead tree dictionary. It was a dead tree dictionary in 2013. And when we launched the dictionary, and it was a very proud moment in my life because it was the culmination of several years of work of a very large team of at least 30 people, uh, I felt a bit whakama, actually. I felt a bit, a, bit, a bit embarrassed because it had a hefty price tag on it because it was published by a legal publisher, and I'm very grateful to LexisNexis for publishing it, but this kind of resource, this dead tree resource, was beyond this, the resources of our students, actually. Uh, well, not beyond, but it was difficult to pay up to $100, or even over $100, for our dead tree dictionary. So the next step had to be um, inclusion, and I pick up from what Courtney said in the last presentation. Uh, if, if, if there's anything of, of a digital brand associated with the Legal Māori Resource Hub, our, our website that I'll show you shortly, it's that, it's inclusion, it's making sure that all of these resources in some way are accessible by anybody who is interested in exploring te reo Māori, and not only those who are interested in it in regards to Western law either. So I'll come back to the link shortly, but I will just um, advance the slides, as they say. I wanted to just leave you, or at least give you, a, an insight on the, which comes out of the research that came out of the Legal Māori project, uh, because I'll be able to explore this a little bit by using the hub as well to show you. So one of the things we discovered in the years between 2008, 2007, 2008, and 2013, we published the dictionary, was that using customary legal terms was actually a launching pad for identifying other legal terms. And using those customary legal terms could also show the change of the lexicon over time. Custom, I mentioned before that this was very much a project aimed at extrapolating, or sorry, extracting out vocabulary pertaining to Western legal ideas. It became pretty obvious very early on that we could not do that if we did not first look to Māori customary vocabulary. And it came, uh, and 
in effect, Māori customary legal vocabulary became the heart and soul of a dictionary about Western legal Māori terms. And one of the interesting things about our dictionary, and this is a function, if you like, of the fact that it's diachronic, right? It's, it's sourced from material dating from 1828, is that we get a sense of how words rise and fall in usage in these printed texts. They're only printed texts, not handwritten, that we digitised. And so we've got a big disconnect. And the terms from our dictionary, um, the 2,113 in total, 716 only appear throughout the whole period of time. Only some of these terms actually are used throughout the time period. 1,200 only appear after 1970. So you can see there's a, a falling away of usage and then there's a resurgence, and that's not surprising given what also happened in Māori society from 1970 onwards. 710 entries only appear before 1910. So there's a disconnection between the, the reo that we're using now, or the, I should say the lexicon that we're using now to express legal, legal concepts, and the lexicon that was being used in the 19th century. So oh, 1,168 entries don't appear at all between the years of 1910 and 1970. In part, that's because there's far fewer sources, but also the fact that we've got bookends of usage uh, suggests that there's something also going on there about how the language is being used and that one end of this time period is not talking to the other end of that time period. So that's an insight that we got because we were able to explore the usage of these terms throughout time. So we decided to prioritise customary legal terms. Uh, so um, and you can see there, of all of the terms, 42% of the terms are either single word customary law uh, words or phrases involving a customary law word. So that's, you know, that's, that's not quite what I foresaw, actually. I thought that we'd have a lot more uh, creation of new words. There is certainly that going on, but and even when you're creating new words or new combinations of words, we are calling on those customary law ideas. So there's consequences for our dictionary format, in the dead tree format at least, um, by virtue of uh, what we were discovering about the role of customary law. So we had to say to people in our dictionary entries, hold up, this word you're about to look at here has a customary connotation you must pay attention to. There's all kinds of other layers of meaning from Western law that come on top of that, but you must see visually at least that there is a connection with customary law. I wanted to focus on one word, aitsua, and I'm going to use this word to explore a little bit about through our, um, our Legal Māori Resource Hub so you can get a sense of how it works. So the word aitsua is not an uncommonly heard word, often used to refer to accident, unfortunate occurrence, unfortunate unforeseen occurrence. Uh, there's a traditional meaning associated with the word aitsua, and often um, connected to the breaking of a tapu, something along those lines, where some kind of natural order has been upset and something unfortunate has happened as a result. So this is a customary legal idea. What we also found in our exploration of Māori legal language is that when we looked at how aitsua appeared in our corpus over time, it had this traditional idea attached to it, but after 1938, something interesting happens. It takes on another meaning, that of compensatable accident. What happened in 1938? The passage of the, of the uh, Social Security Act, and um, there's a couple of other pieces of legislation too, which referred to workers' compensation. And so that's where we first see the word aitsua taking on board this new Western legal idea of a compensatable accident. There was another sense, actually, which referred specifically to injustice, namely injustice perpetrated by Pākehā upon Māori. But interestingly, in our corpus, that sense drops away after 1970, and the main use, one of the main senses that we now see it in, is this idea of, of accidental injury, compensatable accident. This is what it looks like in Dead Tree. 
So you can see at the top, we've got the, uh, the grayed out box, and that's an alert to the reader that there's something customary going on with this, these particular terms here, so you must take that into account. We took the content of those gray boxes from Te Mata Puninga, uh, customary lexicon, uh, that was produced also in 2013. So you can see the senses there, accident and justice, and you also see uh, with accident, that it um, appears mid and cont. You can see in the little, um, the, what do you call those brackets, these pointy ones, <laughs> uh, from the mid period, so that's after 1910, but actually it really first appears in 1938, and it appears in the contemporary period as well, but not before 1910 in that use. Um, and then we've got down the bottom here, aitua ohorere, which also refers to accident, and that's the word that's been picked up by Accident Compensation Corporation in their Māori language translations and is consequently passed into the language that way. So what I want to show you is the hub itself. So if you've got a device and you want to have a look at what we're doing, please feel free. I want to show you how, the, how we can kind of track through one particular word and its evolution, if you like, through our corpus. So this is the Legal Māori Resource Hub. This is uh, Te Pukapu Reo Ture. Um, it's bilingual, so you can choose uh, Māori or English as your language um, for reading this particular site. And we have a quick search function up here. And if I search for Aitua here, uh, select dictionary, So you can see how from the dead tree format into the digital format, we've preserved this kind of warning, warning, customary law term ahead, must take note. Uh, so we've got our senses there, accident and justice. It's probably a little bit small. Um, oh, I'm not sure how you're viewing it out there. But one of the things, so we've got the entire dictionary online here, which is just one of the outputs. One of the really lovely things that I love about our, uh, our, our, our hub is that I can now go and look at Aitua in the corpus. So I can go to that first, or I can go to it through, any, um, through the dictionary as well. So let's look at what Aitua looks like in the corpus. And here's what I mean when I talk about a corpus. So that's all the texts digitally available, and then a concordance is produced for you of Aitua, and it's in, oh, what did I do? Sorry. There it is. Um, and so the first, Incident here is 1839, so that's not in one of the senses that I was talking about before, it's in other senses. And then all the way down, there's 279 or so examples, and it takes us down to the most recent example is 2009, because that's when the most recent texts were inserted into the corpus, or rather those are the, that's the year that they date from. So you can, you've got a chance there to see how Aitsua is being used, you can, also, um, you can also order it by right collocate. So for language enthusiasts, one of the things we look for in how to understand our lexicon is how patterns are formed in language. And one of the ways to get a pattern is to order your, your concordance by a right collocate. In other words, the word to the immediate right of your target word. And you can see all kinds of grammatical patterns that might uh, emerge from that, so you can see uh, this one, Aitua, for example, if I scroll down, I can see down here, Ohorere, that phrase I showed you before, which is basically, uh, again, the, the notion of an accident, particularly with an accidental injury involved in there somewhere. Uh, you can see how, it, how the kind of company that words keep, the neighbours they have, the salience or the glue that might hold words together. So the corpus can show you a lot of information if you're interested in how to work that out. But if you wanted a little bit of reference information, uh, well, actually, this is not reference information. This is uh, looking at the most, a summary of the information here. So Aitsua has these words on its right, and you can flick to these phrases. So I mentioned ohorere before, Aitsua ohorere, these are glued together. There's a, there's, a, there's a degree of salience between these words. Now you can have a look at it more specifically and go to its own little uh, concordance. Any second now. Ah, there it is. So 
You can explore those phrasal connections, if you like. Um, if I wanted to, let's go back, uh, where am I? I'll just do, sorry, I'll just, I'll just do another. Um, the other thing I can do here is look to the, the references. So if I wanted to look at the reference for the second sense of injustice, it tells me where it comes from. Uh, it's got quite, and then I can go to the scans of the text if we have the scans. Many of them we do for the 19th century. And then for full text as well. So if I viewed the images of this one, um, and Max was, wherever you are, Max, uh, was deeply involved in putting these scans up. This is so you can look directly at the scans themselves or um, the digitized text here as well, so that's more searchable. So if you wanted to search for particular words on your own, then you've got the digitized text as well. One of the other functions of the Legal, Corp of the Legal Māori Resource Hub is this thing here called the Corpus Browser, and I just want to show you this uh, as well. It's, and I, I need to just pay acknowledgement to Dave Moskovitz of Think Tank. He was the person who created the Freelex system which forms the, 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 the heart and skeleton, if you like, of the Legal Mighty Resource Hub, but also the websites and publishing team at Victoria University who uh, took Dave's information and created this um, nice and simple interface for us. So with the corpus browser, so I showed you the corpus before, so you can enter any word you like, any word, doesn't have to be a legal word. If you want to see the, I don't know, if you want to look up swear words, you can look up swear words in Māori if you know what they are, there aren't many, <laughs> and you can see how they appear in the corpus, right? There's, not, there's no restriction here to it being legal. But one of the beauties of this resource hub is that you've also got the ability to look at subcorpora and create your own little subcorpora. So each text is categorised, and if I wanted to, for example, look at, uh, let's see, petitions. I always use this one because I, I, lo I love petitions, the 19th century petitions and summaries of the petitions. Um, if I wanted to see how particular words appeared there, I could select this set of documents. So you can do the same thing for legislation, for court transcripts, for a whole bunch of different kinds of documents. Or you can lump them together if you like. You can select a whole bunch. So there are all the um, summaries of petitions from uh, the Native Affairs Committee and some of the texts of uh, petitions as well that are into te reo, into, in Te Reo Māori. And you can look at the sources themselves by these links here. Uh, but if I wanted to see a particular word, let's say I wanted to see how the word rangatiratanga is used. Oh, aitua, but I'll go with rangatiratanga because that's what I feel like. In the subcorpus, I just have to enter the term and then it will sort it for me. And, oh gosh. There it is, and I think that's, there's only a few incidents. It's interesting, actually. Rangatiratanga is a word that doesn't appear as often as you think it would appear in the 19th century. It's, it's actually not that common. And there's interesting things you can say about a language by the appearance and the frequency and the prominence of the words and w at what periods of time that it appears in these printed texts. And then, of course, if I wanted to look any more closely at any one of these texts, I could just go to the reference, um, view the work, And again, I can go straight through to the images or full text. So there's nice connections between all of the resources. So the corpus browser links nicely to the corpus, which links nicely to the dictionary, and you can skip back through them, and you've always got your access to your reference, to your reference information. Um, so what I want to happen from this resource and for it to get more widely known is for people to play with it, to use it, to find out and answer their own questions about how words, the particular words they might be interested in, and to basically just get excited about how you can find out how the, the, the language is used. There's nothing else that I'm aware of, of this nature, in regards to 
Māori, actually it's pretty rare to find an English corpus actually this accessible either. I mean, this is a quite a simple interface. If you're going to be involved in corpus linguistics, uh, and there's all kinds of programs out there that can mine amazing information about the texts of a corpus, but it will cost you money to get those programs and you need to kind of learn how to use them. It's not particularly accessible. But this is a very user-friendly, all those simple interface between the user and the corpus, but also with the dictionary as well. So we are no longer dead tree. Uh, we are um, hopefully creating digital inclusion for all people who are interested in te reo Māori and how it expresses legal, ma legal ideas. So, kia ora. I'm sorry to wrap that up because that is a really fantastic collection, very unique and, and special thing to have done. Um, we've probably got time for one question. Right, Mark, shout. Oh. Uh, Kia ora, that's such an um, amazing resource, it's such an amazing process that you must have gone through to, to get to this point. Yes, kia ora. Um, I'm interested in uh, whether the corpus was digitised already or how much of it you did yourself, or you had to identify and digitise yourself. We had to identify and digitise everything. Oh, mm, there's a few texts that we could, there's some texts we could get from um, uh, the Māori Language Commission has a, has, a, has a corpus and we took some texts from there, but we had to be very specific that these were texts connected in some way to law, so be it engaging with law in some way, um, but that had to be a focus of the text, there had to be a legal Māori text. So for example, we didn't include the Bible. Uh, there is legal language in the Bible, but it's not a legal text, or it's not specifically so. So we had to design the corpus in such a way that it really was a legal corpus to that extent. So yeah, we, was, we were starting a lot from scratch. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Māori. Uh, Māori. Uh, big clap for, for that. <laughs> Thank you.